Good morning. I've got a bird hunting on a rock here in the bottom left-hand side. And every now and then he'll squawk. There's a lot of other birds flying in and out. And here comes the sun. Well, we, we got cut off, so I'm gonna restart over that little piece. For some of you, you'll get to hear it twice. And yes, my boys are with me. <laughs> Watching that bird hunt has been amusing me. <laughs> okay, here we go. Extraordinary Feats, Chapter 95. Psychokinesis in the Martial Arts. The growing literature on the martial arts is packed with stories that to Western ears are unbelievable. Yet an increasing number of observers testify to the truth of at least some of them. In some feats, performed by martial artists. Physical contact is made with a person or object, but the influence exerted seems greater than the degree of contact made. It appears that the real work is done by a force much more powerful than any that the muscles alone provide. We will mention instances in which this is only a slight possibility, then work up to cases where an unknown force is the only likely explanation. In the Tameshiwari, or breaking aspect of karate, trained karateka, <laughs> can smash boards, bricks, cement blocks, ice, and roofing tiles with various parts of their body, including the fists, open hands, and even their heads and fingers. In some of these breaking techniques, the effect seems to go beyond the immediate physical contact made between mere flesh and rock, tiles, or glass. Chow and Spangler observed and photographed a master who said he would strike five bricks piled on top of each other, splitting each in two except for the second from the top. He did as he promised. The popularizer of Kung Fu, Bruce Lee, demonstrated in public before photographers, his capacity to deliver a punch of tremendous impact, standing right foot forward with his almost fully extended right arm an inch away from his partner, who held a heavily padded glove against his chest for protection. In this position, from which it is physically impossible generate enough power to hurt an opponent, Lee knocked his partner flying into a waiting chair several feet behind him. A variant of Lee's technique is the delayed death touch. This refers to the ability reported through... This refers to the ability reported, though difficult to prove, to strike a person in a vital spot and for the effect to be delayed by hours, days, or even months. In carrying this out, the attacker strikes the victim in a certain spot, at a certain time, in a certain way. Instead of dropping on the spot, the victim goes on his way, though some unknown process through some unknown process, his vital energy is affected, and at a certain point in his inner cycle, the effect of the touch is felt, and he dies or is seriously ill. There are, in fact, eyewitness accounts of 
men struck in the abdomen by blows that barely marked the skin, who died later of ruptured spleens or kidneys, destroyed by the shock wave of energy dispatched by fist or foot. This quote unquote death touch can be explained by suggestion if in fact complicity yeah, is not involved. American psychologist Martin Sel Sel Selgeman yeah, whatever, has studied voodoo deaths among Caribbean people and concluded that the victim's faith is the cause of death. Aware of a hex and sure of its power, the victim falls into a kind of learned helplessness and slides into submissive death. But what about cases in which the victim is unaware of his intended fate? Then if it is suggestion, it must be operate. <laughs> this is Oh, Lordy. Okay. But what about cases in which the victim is unaware of his intended fate? Then, if it is suggestion, it must operate by telepathy. A possibility that's not as far-fetched as it sounds at first. According to certain reports... It is hinted that Russian researchers are working on techniques to influence people at a distance by telepathy. Excuse me. Some writers suggest that the delayed death touch is an application of the principles of acupuncture. One writer says, it stands to reason that a powerful medicine or medical technique can just as easily kill or cripple as cure. Another technique is the apparently simple but powerful matter of expelling the breath. That has such a tenuous physical basis that it can hardly account for the results it is claimed to produce. A famous Chinese boxer, Yang Lushan, is said to have knocked a young challenger 30 feet across a room simply by expelling his breath with a laugh when the young man let fly a punch at the famous boxer's stomach. Finally, two techniques in the martial arts seem to make sense only in terms of some kind of PK. One is the spirit shout art or Ka'ai shout. E.J. Harrison tells of a master who saw a few sparrows perched on the branch of a tall pine tree and fixing his steadfast gaze on the birds gave utterance to the Ka'ai shout whereupon the birds fell to the ground insensible. When he relaxed the Ka'ai, the birds regained consciousness and flew away. Harrison says the shout was also employed for the opposite effect, that of restoring to consciousness persons that doctors had given up for dead. <clears throat> Martial artist Robert Smith tells many anecdotes about the renowned Chinese boxer Lai Ning Jian. One concerns a young man who, on the pretext of offering tea to Li, planned to attack him, as in spite of his reputation, he appeared to be a harmless old man. When he did so, says Smith, Li merely used a spirit shout that knocked the young man out without spilling his tea or interrupting his conversation with another man. When asked about it, <clears throat> excuse me, the young man replied with, I heard thunder, 
His hands had eyes. I fell unconscious. A last technique, inexplicable in ordinary physical terms, is Noikun, N-O-I-C-U-N, which Michael Minnick describes as follows. A last technique, <clears throat> inexplicable in ordinary physical terms, is Noikun, which Michael Minnick describes as follows. More commonly known as the divine technique, this is a very rare form of Kung Fu, practiced only a handful of, oh my God, by only a handful of adepts. I keep getting corrected and then I don't remember which way is the right way. So for those of you who have corrected me, thank you very much, but uh, it did not stick. I'm right. Practice by only a handful of followers. It is not widely taught or particularly popular because it takes the better part of a lifetime to master. And quite frankly, it strains the credul credulity of those who are asked to believe that it exists. Simply put, it is a means of generating internal power so enormous one can fell an opponent without actually touching him. As fantastic as this sounds, most Kung Fu masters insist that such an art exists, and many claim to have witnessed it. One modern master writing in Karate Illustrated stated, <clears throat> Excuse me. Here in San Francisco lives a 107-year-old master who is still able to use Noi Kun, the use of internal power. Despite his age and the frailty of his body, I personally have seen him demonstrate in one of his demonstrations, he asked a young man to step to the center of the room. Then placing himself a few yards away, he stretched forth his arm, palm pointed outward, and concentrated deeply. Drawing from within the great force of his chi, and within a few moments, the lad was staggering backward, pushed off balance by the unseen force, radiating from that outstretched hand. <sighs> Minnick adds that the same master gave another example of Noi Kun, including that of a man in Hong Kong who broke a glass vase from across a room. Chow and Spangler gave a variation of it, known as, no, <laughs> node, oh my God, <laughs> known <laughs> as Red Sand Palm. Red Sand Palm. In this variation, without touching an assailant's body, the adept merely makes signs of rubbing or striking at him with the palm of one hand from a distance, and the receiver will be injured. The wound will cause irreparable damage. Death usually follows in 10 to 15 days. They also describe one finger kung in which, should the forefinger be aimed at an opponent, even though separated by a door, he still could be injured or destroyed. Chow also witnessed a student who held a washboard 
with the corrugations facing his stomach, the skin of which was unblemished. A master, standing four feet away, meditated for half a minute and then flicked his wrist toward the board, but without touching either it or the student. When the student lowered the washboard and raised the sweater, the lines from the washboard were outlined in red across his stomach. In all the examples given here, it is difficult or even impossible to see how ordinary physical principles could account for the feats accomplished. In cases such as expelling breath and the red sand palm, and possibly even the hand smashing of Karateka, the same principle may be acting as in the spirit shout art about which E.J. Harris noted, it is not the shout itself. Okay, stop, little spider. It is not the shout itself, but the force behind dictating it that is really responsible for the phenomenon. Another indication that the mind plays an essential role in the feats described is the stress that athletes both east and west place on confidence arnold palmer told george plimpton when i'm working well i just don't think i'm going to miss a shot or a putt and when i do i am surprised as hell i can't believe it the golfer must think that way I don't mean to suggest that it's easy. In fact, the hardest thing for a great many people is to win. They, dot, 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 doubt, which gets them into trouble. Matsutatsu Oyama says, the most important thing in the stone breaking techniques is psychological self-confidence. He adds that if you try to break a stone, no matter how small, when you are not feeling confident, in nine cases out of 10, you will break a bone, dislocate something or injure yourself in some other way. Yet in a confident state, one can break many stones without a single bruise. If it is purely a matter of physics, why should it matter? whether or not one feels confident? Well, that is a good question. All right, the next little section I'm gonna squeeze on this one is elusiveness. Hmm, it's probably gonna be interesting. My bird's still over there. Okay, the bird. I hope that he's been entertaining. Okay, elusiveness. Another aspect of these powers is an uncanny elusiveness that in extreme cases gives the impression of downright invisibility. The religious traditions of the East and Middle East consider the art of invisibility to be one of the saddest. All right, I know I know that word, but S I D D H I S, which looks like Sid did his, but I know that's not right. Or extraordinary powers that may develop in following a spiritual path. Mori Hai. Yu Yeshiba, the founder of Aikido, often demonstrated his ability to elude attack in this way. George Lennard writes, uh -oh. I don't want mosquitoes in here. All right, I'm gonna read that just a second. I'm breaking into a sweat. Uh, fighting off mosquitoes, stop it. Thank you. Oh, look. 
look, his friend has joined him. And they have to be friends to hang out together. Oh, here comes trouble. It's like he told him not to be hanging out there. And he was hanging out there. So when I left my house this morning, it was cold, or at least chilly. Now I'm overdressed, sitting in the sun. Enjoy it for just a minute. Little fish, not little fish, good size fish keep jumping out. And again, if you see my little bird friend over there. Oh no. He took off. He didn't want to be shot no more, I guess. I'm not sure he was standing on a rock. He might have been standing on a log. Alright, back to what I'm supposed to be reading here. George. Leonard, or Leonard writes, scores of reliable witnesses have testified to demonstrations by Morahi Yeshiba in which he seemed to go beyond the limitations of known physical law. On one occasion, completely surrounded by men with knives, Yeshiba reputedly disappeared and reappeared at the same instant, looking down at his attackers from the top of a flight of stairs. Yu Yeshiva refused to repeat this feat, saying that the effort involved might take several months from his life. Leonard also quotes his teacher, Robert Nadu, a former student of Yeshiba. On one occasion, the master invited Nadu to attack him, which he did with all his strength, wanting to make a good impression. But when I got close to him, it was like I'd entered a cloud. And in the cloud, there was a giant spring that's throwing me out of the cloud. I find myself flying through the air and I come down with a hard judo type slap fall. Lying there, I look around for Yu Yeshiba, but he isn't to be seen. Finally, I turn all the way around, the one place I wouldn't have expected him to be, and there he is, standing calmly. Leonard or Leonard also describes a film taken of Yu Yeshiba as he was attacked by two men. It shows him facing his attackers, apparently trapped. But in the next frame, he has moved two feet away and is facing in the opposite direction, according to Leonard. While Yeshiba appears to shift from one position to another in a fraction of a second, or in no time at all, the oncoming movement of the attackers proceeds sequentially, a fraction of a step at a time, until the two collide and are pinned by the master. Whether or not Yeshiba's feats can be scientifically validated, the fact remains that those who were best acquainted with the master are convinced that he was operating in another dimension especially in his last years. Again and again, he seems to have just disappeared or to have created a warp in time and space. Such terms as these recur repeatedly in descriptions of Yu Yeshiba's work and may serve to remind us of possibilities that lie beyond the rather rigid structures of any one culture. 
In a provocative article on running back Mark Lane of the Kansas City Chiefs, Robert F. Jones. Robert F. Jones says, There has to be some quality of magic in the elusiveness of the best running backs. The mere physics can no more explain the missed or broken tackles that mark every long run from scrimmage than mere chemistry can explain the excitement such a performance arouses in the spectator. A number of ball players are accredited with this ability to make the ball disappear. It has been said that the great Satchel Page was able to actually dematerialize the ball. Biz Mackey, a great catcher, says of Page's fastball, A lot of pitchers have a fastball, but a very, very few feller, Grove Johnson, couple of others besides Satchel have had that little extra juice that makes the difference between the good and the great man. What, When it's that fast, it will hop a little at the end of the line. Beyond that, it tends to disappear. Yes, disappear. I've heard about Satchel throwing pitches that wasn't hit, but that never showed up in the catcher's mitt nevertheless. They say the catcher, the umpire, and the bat boys looked all over for that ball, but it was gone. Now, how do you account for that? Pele, the the soccer great, confided that on a day when everything was going right, suddenly he felt a strange calmness. I hadn't experienced in any of the other games. It was a type of euphoria. I felt I could run all day without tiring, that I could dribble through any of their team or all of them. I could almost pass through them physically. I felt I could not be hurt. It was a very strange feeling and one I had not felt before. Perhaps it was merely confidence, but I have felt confident many times without that strange feeling of invincibility. Were all these athletes and spectators deluded? Perhaps. But it is also possible that they were keying into what may be the deeper reality of what we have mistakenly assumed was an impenetrable universe, but which in fact is much more mutable and diphaneous that the worlds of the mystic and the physicists physicist are very alike has been pointed out in recent books by Capra, LaShawn, among others. All right, the next little piece is going to be Uncanny Suspension. And then we roll in the Invisible Barrier, Mind Over Matter. Those don't look very long. And then... We are done with chapter four. So I'm gonna see it. Let me see what page is that is one out of the line. Or, yeah, I think I can fit that in the next video. Everybody knows I have to work today, so I will do what I can to get another one. I appreciate you being with me for my sunrise. And reading the book, The Psychic Side of Sports. From 1978, back before we had all these fancy words. All right, let's zoom in. For all of us who do not have a boat, if we did, we could be having that kind of fun. It is so. I appreciate you being with me.